Good morning. My name is Adrian Dix. I'm BC's Minister of Health. Uh, in Victoria today, Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer. I'm honoured to be speaking to you uh, from the territory of the Musqueam, of the Squamish, of the Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Honoured to be here on their lands. Dr. Henry is on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, uh, the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. Dr. Henry will be presenting uh, a presentation on the current state of the COVID-19 pandemic. After that, I'll speak about uh, some issues around uh, hospitals, including uh, um, uh, on issues of rapid testing and uh, healthcare workers who are currently off sick. Uh, and with that, it's my honor, as always, to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you very much. And We've been looking at very intensely over the last few weeks to try and put that puzzle together of where we are in our Omicron wave and how that's impacting um, us in the community but also in our health care system. And this will look a little bit... Uh -huh. I'm just going to ask them to relook at... It was at, it was at the end slide. Let's see if we can try this again. All right. Okay, <laughs> we'll start again. Uh, so on our second slide here, um, it'll look a little bit different today because there are some measures that we have been using all along that are no longer able to be uh, representative of the community. So we don't have geographic representation, for example, and we don't have things like the reproductive number because that depends on us knowing how many people each case have transmitted to. And as I've said a number of times as we've gone through this Omicron wave, we have transmissions that are happening very rapidly and we no longer are able to do that case and contact tracing because of the shortened incubation period that we're seeing with this wave. So we also need to look at other sources to help us validate what we're seeing and to understand the trajectory of what we're seeing in BC compared to other jurisdictions. So one of those is to be able to look at our case rates over time our percent positivity, which is reflected in the colors of these graphs, and compare them to what we're seeing in other jurisdictions. And one of these is, is here the representation of other jurisdictions in, in Canada. And so the height of our, of our peak is, reflects um, the PCR testing. So we've been at the capacity of our PCR tests uh, for a number of weeks now as Omicron has really uh, transmitted in our communities. But it does give us a sense, because we've been monitoring PCR testing over time, it does reflect um, the, the, the change in the patterns over time. Our test positivity has been very high and it's been in the 20s for, for the last little while. We've seen in this past week particularly that we've started to see a decrease in the test positivity and in the numbers of cases of PCR positives. And if we look at other jurisdictions in Canada, um, we see that Ontario and Quebec are slightly ahead of us, um, not as far ahead as we initially thought in terms of the wave going through. And we are seeing as well as they've reported today, um, starting to see that decrease in community transmission in those jurisdictions as well. Other places in Canada are slightly behind us and they're still very much on the upswing. Um, so these are the types of things that we are using to help us understand where we are now. And of course because daily cases are, are limited by our testing capacity and our testing strategy, we also need to watch very carefully hospitalizations and hard endpoints like people who've died from COVID. So this is a, again a reflection of jurisdictions in Canada. The hospitalizations that we're seeing compared to uh, Ontario and Quebec and what we're seeing is we're all on an upward trajectory in numbers of new people admitted to hospital per day. Uh, we're seeing that uh, across the board. If we look on the, the hospital census on the, um, the corner there, what we see is in BC that has been flatter and not as steep a rise as in some of the other jurisdictions in Canada. And I believe, and from uh, data that I'll show you, part of that is because of the measures that um, people have taken in British Columbia, the measures that we put in place in December to try and slow things down and try and prevent uh, hospitalizations. Also also reflects who is in hospital and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that and why we focused our booster dose program for example where we did. So this is our epidemic curve again in uh, that um, so slide four 
Uh, the top line in green is the PCR test positive cases in our community and uh, those have peaked and around the 1st of January and are starting to go down. So we think that we hit the peak of community transmission in British Columbia probably this past weekend. That's important. Um, there's a number of different indicators that allow us to say that with some certainty, and I'm going to go through those. But we are still at the point where our hospitalization rate is going up, so new hospitalizations uh, is still a concern. And we need to understand who is it that's being hospitalized and what can we do to try and affect that trajectory in the next few weeks. So if we look at it across BC, it's not the same everywhere, and we've seen that. We've seen that this started really uh, to take off, particularly Omicron took off in Vancouver Coastal and in Fraser Health and on Vancouver Island first. We're now starting to see it slowing down a bit in interior health, and in northern health we're still on that upward trajectory. It was starting, uh, Omicron moved into that community uh, later than in other parts of the province, but it really is the highly populous lower mainland that is driving the epidemic curve for British Columbia. And the, the little um, bumpy bit that you see in Vancouver Coastal at the top, that's a testing anomaly. Um, and that's because we, we reached the limit of PCR capacity and weren't able to do um, additional PCR testing at that period in time. And so that's why a week, 10 days ago, we weren't able to say where we were in this trajectory because um, it was unclear if it was just because of testing or if it was because we were seeing a true leveling off. And it's very likely that uh, if we had the testing capacity, we would see a peak very similar to what we see in Fraser Health um, in Vancouver Coastal as well. So if we look at what has happened in terms of the trajectory over the last uh, month in particular, as Omicron entered into our lexicon as well as our communities, we've seen a bit of a wave that started with younger people. So people in their 20s, 30s in particular, starting off and then moving into an older age group. And this is something that we've seen as well in all of our waves uh, through the last two years uh, with this um, with this, uh, with this virus. Virus. But what we're also seeing is it moves with the highly connected people. This has been much faster than what we've seen with any other wave. And what, what is concerning now and what we need to pay attention to is the fact that we're seeing this uptick in older people now. And we need to understand a little bit more about who are those people and what we can do to try and make sure that we're stopping that transmission for those who are more vulnerable to having severe illness in our communities. We're also seeing a bit of an uptick in, in younger people, and I'll show a bit more information about that. So importantly, as we've seen this move through the community, we want to know who is most likely to be hospitalized. So looking at the hospital data by age across BC, we see that as well. We are seeing an increase in hospitalization in younger people, and we have more information about who are more likely to be hospitalized in those younger age groups. But more, more concerning, we are seeing recently an increase, a dramatic increase again, in people over age 70 who are having severe illness and ending up in hospital. And unfortunately, that's where we're seeing an uptick in people who are dying from COVID as well. So if we look at this um, from numbers of hospitalizations, the numbers are greatest in the 60 to 79 year age group, but the rate of being admitted to hospital is much highest in people over age 80. We are also seeing a little bit of an uptick in the 0 to 19 in our pediatric age group. And I have more information on that that will help us understand who are those people as well. So when we look at uh, older people being hospitalized, what are the differences? What are the concerning things that uh, come up? Well, one of the most important is that we see that the rates at every age of people needing, having severe enough illness that they need to be in hospital go up dramatically if you don't have the protection that vaccination offers. And so even having two doses of vaccine before you get your booster dose, it's very highly protective for most people. And that's important. That means that all of those things that we have done over this past two years to make sure that we get the best protection possible, the 90% of people in BC who've got their vaccinations, that is helping 
that is helping make sure that you don't have severe enough illness as this new strain is spreading that you'll end up in hospital. Where we're seeing that, um, that little bit of a crack is in older people um, over age 70 and even with two doses there's still a risk in older people because we don't mount a strong and immune response and so even if you're vaccinated with two doses it's really important to get your booster dose. And one of the reasons why we have really uh, focused on our, our booster dose program on older people and people who have immune compromising conditions and are more at risk is because we know that that extra dose makes a big difference. So on the next slide, what this shows again is hospitalizations by age. And what you can see is that line on the top, no matter what age you are, um, hospitalization risk is much higher if you don't have any protection, any immune priming from vaccination. And if you're over age 70, you really need that booster dose too. And we know there's about 50,000 people over age 70 who've got two doses of vaccine who've not yet got their, their booster dose. This is really important right now. It gives you that added extra protection that you need to keep you from having more severe disease that leads to hospitalization. So that's an important thing for us all to recognize. And for those who uh, are younger and feel like you can get through this, we are still seeing high rates of hospitalization in younger people who don't don't have any protection. And that right now, um, we talked a little bit about breakthrough and reinfections. So people who have been infected with other strains of this virus, um, Omicron is more likely to infect you right now and more likely to cause severe enough illness that you're going to need hospitalization if you don't have vaccine as well. So it is important to recognize that as more of this virus spreads in our community and we have, um, we have people who are vaccinated getting infected, the people who are not vaccinated, your risk goes up of being exposed to the virus and after being exposed to the virus, the risk goes up of having more severe illness and ending up in hospital. And of course, the other part of that is ending up in critical care. So what we have seen as even two doses of vaccine in older people is highly protective of keeping you out of the ICU and critical care in our hospitals. So yes, we're seeing an uptick in severe enough disease to end up in hospital, but um, not in ICU. And that's not the case for people who don't have that immune priming that vaccination gives. So when we look at again, uh, across the board, about 17% of people in British Columbia, and that includes people, uh, young people zero to four years of age who, for whom there is not yet a vaccine. Um, uh, those people um, are, are right now, 47% of people in our hospitals are uh, mostly adults, so not the zero to four, but mostly adults who have not been vaccinated. And 70% of people in critical care in the past month are people who have not been vaccinated. And this is mostly Omicron, mostly, uh, sorry, mostly uh, um, Omicron and a combination of Omicron and Delta. And two thirds of the people who've died from COVID in the past month have been people who have not been vaccinated from the very small percentage of people um, who no, don't yet have vaccine yeah, in BC. And this is, uh, breaks it all down. It's quite a busy slide. It's our, what I call the placemat. But it talks about, it shows you um, that age is still the number one most important risk factor for having severe illness, for ending up in hospital, or having complications from COVID 19. And that's really important. And vaccination works. Vaccination protects you from that severe illness. And I think I can't say this enough. That level of protection is what is getting us through this wave without overwhelming our hospital system, stretched as it is. And as I mentioned, the risk profile has changed for people who don't have that protection on board because we know that even if you're vaccinated, this Omicron is causing infections in vaccinated people, which means that extra protection 
unvaccinated people had from the, the community um, being protected is no longer there. So if you don't have a vaccine on board right now, if you don't have that immune stimulation, that protection, you're at much higher risk than you were even um, two weeks or six weeks ago. And if we look at this from a, the perspective of age standardized, so somebody the same age as me who's vaccinated with two doses of vaccine, so not even with a boost, booster dose, my risk if I don't have that, uh, if I don't, have not yet been vaccinated, is 12 times higher of having severe enough illness that I need to be in hospital, 27 times higher of developing severe enough illness that I need critical care. This is really important right now. It shows us that vaccination is really protective for people having severe illness and staying out of hospital. And this is another way of looking at it. I know uh, when we look at the numbers every day and there's been a lot of people who have been remarking on the fact that there's more vaccinated people in hospital than unvaccinated people. But that number comes from a much, much bigger pool of people. So your risk of hospitalization is dramatically lower. And I think it's you know putting the perspective on those numbers. If you're somebody who doesn't have the protection that vaccines are offering right now, your chances of having a severe enough illness that you need hospitalization are much, much higher. Um, I spoke a little bit about the pediatric profile, so this is slide 16. Um, we have seen an increase just this week and younger people ending up in hospital and needing hospital care. And there's been nine admissions this week in the zero to four age group and two each in five to 11 and 12 to 17. Um, thankfully, we have not seen uh, any of these children yet requiring uh, critical care and we've got no new deaths in this age group. But this reflects again the fact that uh, this virus is spreading widely in our community and how important it is for all of us around young people, zero to four particularly, um, young people um, making sure that we're vaccinated to do the best we can to protect them from transmission. We know that uh, the case rates are higher when they don't have vaccine and the same goes for, for children as well. We've only had one case in the, of a, a child hospitalized who's been vaccinated. So it offers you protection as a, as a child yourself um, for, uh, for children over age five. But it also makes sure that we do our best to try and reduce the risk of transmission to others. And it is really important for us to pay attention to that right now. I will say that with Omicron, we're seeing a different pattern for younger people. It's more of an upper respiratory illness. We saw this in the US, we're seeing this in other jurisdictions and we've been watching it here and talking to our, our pediatric colleagues. It's what they're seeing as well, that it behaves more like some of the other respiratory viruses in triggering things like asthma and airway disease and, um, and bronchiolitis in young children. So that's most commonly the reason why they're in hospital after infection with with uh, with COVID and now mostly Omicron. But I will say we do have other respiratory viruses that are circulating this year and are causing illness in young people and in long-term care homes. Uh, last year we didn't see very much of influenza, RSV, we didn't see very much of anything. Um, and partly that's because of, of international travel and all the measures that we're taking. So the things that we do do make a difference in preventing these other infections as well. What we have seen this year is uh, quite a large increase in respiratory syncytial virus, much more like what we would see on a normal respiratory virus season. Um, we still have a little bit of influenza, not a lot this year, but it is out there. And it is causing illness in young people. It's one of the most common reasons, RSV particularly, while younger uh, children are being admitted to hospital over the last couple of months, um, in addition to the small number that we're seeing related to COVID. The other thing that we're seeing is that RSV can cause, and we've known this, uh, outbreaks in long-term care homes. And the most severe outbreak we've seen in the past month in a long-term care home has been caused by RSV. So those measures that we have in place to protect long-term care homes, they do protect against this as uh, RSV and influenza as well. Um, 
one of the things I will say is that with so much virus circulating, we have a lot of milder illness caused by Omicron primarily in long-term care homes across the province. And we're working with the long-term care homes, working with residents and, and families to make sure that the measures that we take are, are proportional to the, the change in illness that we're seeing. Partly because we have so much good protection of residents with the booster doses in long-term care homes, and Omicron itself is causing a much milder illness in uh, in long-term care for the most part. So those are things that uh, we're working through with um, the long-term care homes right now. So understanding. Um, the new reality that we're in, this new wave of Omicron, and how it has changed is something that we've been adjusting to and trying to um, make adjustments for over the last few weeks. And this is the whole genome sequencing pattern that we've seen across, uh, across the, the province since the, the pandemic started. Um, and what we can see is the red uh, there is, is Omicron. And it has rapidly replaced Delta in a much shorter time frame than we've seen any of the other variants uh, emerge and replace uh, over time. And that has meant that it is a different game that we're in now. It's a different pandemic. And we've had to adapt and adjust and make these changes with the imperfect information that we have and in real time, essentially. So we've seen this replaced here in BC in the last, in about four uh, weeks, which is similar to what we're seeing in other jurisdictions, where it's about four to five weeks for Omicron to come in and rapidly replace other strains that are circulating. It's not the same across the province. What we saw is it emerged first in Vancouver Coastal and Fraser and, uh, and Island Health um, and moved very quickly there. A um, little bit later in interior health, but now has mostly replaced uh, Delta there, and a little bit later in northern health, although it is replacing Omicron. So what does that mean for us? And how do we understand with this rapidly changing um, virus that, as we've talked about, we now know has a shorter incubation period for most people because of vaccination, has a shorter uh, duration of illness, and most people aren't aren't getting a severe enough illness that they need to be hospitalized. That's the good news. Um, the challenging part is understanding where we are on the trajectory in terms of transmission in our community and also what is going to be the impact on our health care system. The important things that help us um, getting through this pandemic, recognizing that transmission in the community and impact on the health care system is now affected by two things. One is numbers of people in hospital, how long they stay there, but also the fact that this is infecting health care workers. And even with um, uh, illness that doesn't make me go to a hospital myself, um, health care workers having to be at home um, recovering from their illness has led to uh, staff being off ill in higher numbers um, than ever before in this pandemic. So in trying to understand that, we've been looking at uh, models and we look at uh, analogies from other communities and other parts of the world, as I've mentioned before. So one of the things we're looking at is uh, how is our trajectory comparing to other jurisdictions where Omicron has become the dominant variant in a very similar pattern, a very similar time frame. And particularly, uh, we're looking at a couple of urban centres so that's on the left. And we've uh, compared it with London, which is ahead of us in terms of measuring this over time. Uh, Washington, D.C. and New York City are good representations of, of this, the movement of Omicron over time. And we can see that our populated, populated urban areas are following a very similar trajectory. And particularly if we look at Vancouver Coastal, I mentioned there's that, that flattening, bumpy bit. Um, we saw a very similar thing in London as testing capacity was, was reaching limits there. And so it was difficult to tell for a period of time if um, if we were seeing a, a slowing down or if it was still going up and we just weren't measuring it. But we can now say with some confidence that the pattern shows a, a, a sustained decrease and that that pattern reflects what we're seeing in other jurisdictions that have a similar uh, Omicron dominant uh, outbreak right now.
And if we look at this from a regional perspective, um, BC is following a very similar pattern to what we see in uh, what we saw in South Africa, what we're seeing in the UK, and uh, what we've put in there Florida and Denmark as well as two uh, other. Um, jurisdictions that are going through a very similar situation than we are. Obviously it's not perfect and this is just one way that we look at it. We, we sort of triangulate and look at many different things to see if, if we can say with some confidence where we are in the, the course of our trajectory. One of the other surveillance measures that we've been watching over time and I've presented this before is the wastewater surveillance. And so when we look at wastewater surveillance, it's not dependent on who gets tested. It really is a, a barometer of how much virus is in a community. And uh, we see that it follows quite closely to peaks that we've seen in the past. And we're seeing that again. The concentrations of the virus that we're finding in the wastewater surveillance that has been gone, ongoing for over a year peaked around the first week of January, which is very similar to the data that we're seeing from the PCR testing, which is very similar to the other surveillance measures that we've been looking at, and that we're now on a, a decreasing trajectory of concentration, certainly not back down to the levels that we were seeing in Vancouver Coastal and Fraser um, in the summer, for example, um, but on that downward trajectory. So this gives us more confidence that we are, at least in terms of transmission in the community, we've reached the peak and we're starting on that downward trajectory. Of course, the other really important things is the impact on our hospital system. Over time, we've also always been looking at hospital occupancy. So this is census. So this is on a day-by-day -day basis, how many people are in a hospital in BC with a positive COVID test? This is an, an overestimate of the number of people who are in hospital because of COVID, but it helps us understand the impact on our health care system, um, in particular on the hospital system. And we've been uh, following this over time. We can see that there's been an increase, um, particularly we were at a nice low at the end of November and then as Omicron moved into the community, we started to see this increase uh, on top of the residual increases we had uh, from, from the Delta wave that we were dealing with most of the fall. And on the very bottom, there is uh, the dark blue is critical care. So that senses number of people in critical care with a COVID positive test. And this is, um, this is something that we've been following uh, uh, very carefully. And as we have rapidly changing situations, it's a more um, important daily measure of the impact on our healthcare system. But it's a composite measure that tells us a bunch of different things. And we need to understand a little better who's included in that census. So we will be reporting hospital census data starting on a daily basis, starting today, which will mean a jump in numbers of people included in that number. And I'll talk through a little bit where we get uh, what that means. Some of the things that we've been uh, following over time to try and understand the impact that Omicron is going to have on our hospitals are things like emergency department visits for COVID. And this is uh, uh, looking at the visits in uh, Vancouver Coastal and Providence Healthcare uh, for the month uh, over the past year up until January 11th. As we can see, there's been a dramatic increase in people going to the hospital, uh, to the emergency department uh, related to COVID. So that may be because of COVID, it may be because another condition is exacerbated, it may be because they tested positive and they have concerns. So those visits have increased and they're starting starting to perhaps level off. They have not started to come down yet, so it's an early marker. But what we are, are looking at really carefully is the proportion of people who visit an emergency department who end up being admitted to hospital. And we can see that that proportion is much less than what we had in previous waves, particularly in, in March and April and May of, uh, of 2021, um, where that proportion was much higher. So that's something that tells us a little bit about um, severity of the illness with Omicron. The other thing that we are looking at is how many people in hospital are there because of Omicron, how many people are uh, there because they've been infected with Delta, which we know causes more severe illness in general. And then, of course, as, as we've come uh, closer to 
the, the, this week, um, there's still a, a number of people who have been admitted to hospital who we don't yet have a sequence, a whole genome sequence, because there's a delay in being able to do those sequences. But what this helps us understand is for those that we know are Omicron, are they any, in any way different? And this gets at severity of illness and the impact on hospitals. And we've seen in other countries, in South Africa, in Copenhagen, in the UK, that people who are admitted uh, because of an Omicron infection um, has, tend to have a shorter length of stay and may and not as severe illness. So we need to understand if that holds true in our population here in BC. So what we have looked at is for those uh, between the end of November and the 7th of January, looking at people who we know had Delta, people we know had uh, were infected with Omicron, and then the unknown. And what this tells us is consistent with what we're seeing in other jurisdictions. So the median length of stay is about half of what we are seeing with people with Delta. So compared to, to Delta, Omicron, um, people aren't as sick. Um, and the, the need for critical care is down by about two-thirds. So only 12 percent of people who are infected with Omicron um, compared to people who are infected with uh, Delta. And the same thing goes for severe enough illness that it leads to death. So there's a whole lot of caveats here in that uh, we know a younger population was infected early, um, but it really does align with what we're seeing in other places that uh, people who are admitted to hospital uh, are admitted at a lower rate and have a lower need for uh, critical care and also a shorter length of stay. And so those unknown people, if we look at the pattern that we're seeing in that 300 and and 58 um, people who were admitted in the last seven days, um, many of them are still in hospital, and so we can't say anything about length of stay yet. Um, but they are more reflective of what we're seeing with Omicron. So that's telling us that we're starting to see uh, the, the Omicron impact on our hospitals. And so we need to know. One, um, is it because of COVID that, and Omicron that they're being admitted? Or is it an incidental finding? And then we need to have an understanding of how long this trajectory is going to go. So we've been trying, as we have across the country, to try and separate this. This has not been as important an issue um, before Omicron. Because there is so much transmission in the community, we are now finding uh, that people are being incidentally testing positive. What that means is they're being admitted for something else. Most commonly we're seeing it, um, people admit it for surgery, people admit it to labor and delivery or to, um, uh, to medical wards, uh, mental health issues who are being screened with a test on admission to hospital and those tests are turning up positive. So they're not being hospitalized because of the impact of COVID either directly or indirectly from exacerbation of other illness, but they're being found incidentally. And uh, this is uh, something we've been trying to tackle uh, with, I mentioned this before, with my colleagues across the country. Ontario presented some data this week on, on how they're looking at it. This is tricky to get to because it really means we have to look at, do a chart review of every individual case. And we're trying to find a way to automate it so we have a better sense. But one of the chart reviews that we did do was that all of the hospitalizations in the month of December, um, so it was up until the people who were admitted up until January 11th in Vancouver Coastal Health. And this gives us a representative sample of what we might be seeing in other places. And we have been working with each health authority and it probably is about the same in each health authority. So what this tells us is that about 45 percent of the people admitted to hospital with a COVID positive test, it was an incidental finding. And about 50 percent of them, it was actually because of their, of their COVID um, diagnosis. And right now, uh, as we're transitioning and we presented what I just showed you, um, most of the people uh, being admitted to hospital still are, are related to Delta. So that's the blue in this slide. And people requiring um, invasive intervention, so that's mostly critical care, ICU, needing uh, oxygen or intubation, again, most more likely to be infected with Delta. 
So this is, gives us an indication of what we might be seeing in our hospitals right now. It's not uh, across the board and what we're looking at is how do we get that picture on an ongoing basis. So what we are going to be uh, reporting and our daily hospital numbers will be that composite number of uh, hospital census. So today, that n the yesterday I think it was about 534 was in our hospital, um, uh, people in hospital. Starting today we'll be using the census numbers and that will jump up a little bit. It'll be about 600 and some. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is because it includes all of these different people. So it includes people related because of COVID. It includes people who are incidentally found to have COVID-19. And it includes people who were part of our, an outbreak or a cluster in a hospital. So they acquired it while they were in a hospital for something else. It also includes people who um, are hospitalized because of social circumstances and people from out of country or out of province who are hospitalized in BC. So it is uh, the the overall um, overestimate of the impact of COVID, but it does represent the uh, the impact on and the burden of uh, COVID related illness in our hospitals. And then as we get the automated processes in place to be able to tease apart these three different uh, groups of people in hospital. We'll be presenting that on a periodic basis as a snapshot. And I know this sounds complicated, but you know we know that about 30 to 40 uh, people have been admitted a day, and there's an equal number of people that are uh, discharged from hospital. So it's it's a very fluid situation, and people move into critical care and then back onto the ward and then are discharged. And so it's a, a challenging to try and keep up with that transition on a day-to-day -day basis. So what we'll be presenting is the overall hospitalization census, and then uh, on a periodic basis as we're able to try and automate it, we'll be breaking it down. But right now, about 45% of the people in hospital at this point are people who are incidentally found to have COVID. It does have an impact on things like infection control practices in the hospital, um, but it does also give us a measure of where we are in terms of, of uh, impact. We will also be, um, so part of the reason why we did, uh, had presented hospitalization the way we did from the very beginning was linking it with our, our uh, line lists so we can understand severity of illness. How many people in BC who have a diagnosis of, of COVID-19 end up in hospital at any point in their illness? And that's really important for us to know um, because it helps us understand the severity of, of COVID as we're progressing through this pandemic. But that um, is because it means linking of data. It's a little bit delayed. And so right now where we have rapidly increasing cases, and this was something that became apparent uh, when we started to have rapidly increasing cases in uh, in the interior in the summer. Um, those measures can be uh, it can there can be a gap and a delay in, in understanding that. So we're going to be presenting the census on a daily basis, and then weekly we'll be looking at that severity index in more detail. So what does this mean for where we are going and the impact? Um, we've seen that our, in the community, we're on that downward trend. We need to keep it there, which means we need to continue to, to uh, hold the line and do what we're doing to try and prevent us being a source of transmission further in the community. But we also need to understand what we can do to um, in, in fact, uh, hospital um, census. So we looked at our modeling and take, taking into account the same rates of transmission. So this is what we call the scenario, the higher transmission scenario. Same rates of transmission that we were seeing in December prior to putting in the public health measures that we did, which was uh, you know stopping uh, nightclubs and uh, gatherings and putting restrictions on places um, where people were inside. And it looks at uh, booster doses being provided to about 40% of the population. It doesn't look at whether they're the most high risk or not, so it's 40% across the board. And this gives an indication of what we could potentially see over the next little while. It also it takes into account, and, and this aligns with what we are seeing in other jurisdictions, that once you see the peak of transmission in the community, there's a lag of about a week before you see the peak of new admissions to hospital. 
and then there's a lag of about another week before we start to see a decrease in hospital census. And, and this model, um, the bottom on the purple line, is it takes into account Delta, the fact that we're still seeing people hospitalized with Delta. Um, the green line is the Omicron impact, and the, the black dots are where we are right now. And then the orange line at the top is the composite, the, 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 uh, the total of both of those. So what we expect from this modeling um, and uh, the trajectory that we're seeing is that our new admissions to hospital on a daily basis are likely to peak um, between January 15th and 22nd, so sometime next week. So a lag of about a week to, um, after we've started to see that peak in community transmission. And with a lower transmission scenario, so this is the um, taking into account that we put in place some public health measures very rapidly in December as we started to see cases dramatically increase and before we knew all of the information about severity and who was most affected, um, we, we uh, if we have that lower transmission, it blunts um, the peak of hospitalizations, but it spreads it out a little bit more. So the peak might be a little bit later next week. Again, this doesn't uh, take into account. So this is just new admissions, and we're, we'll watch this very carefully, but we expect them to start to decrease um, hopefully by mid to end next week. And then we'll, about a week after that, we'll start to see a decrease in our hospital census. So this tells us that we need to keep doing what we're doing right now and that it's going to be a challenging few weeks on our hospitals. We know that this is at, you know, the peak is coming at the same time that we're still seeing healthcare workers off ill um, and not being able to go into work. And we've been working very closely in every hospital, every community to make sure that we can try as best we can to support as much as we can. The measures that we took in December to do things like stopping of, of non urgent surgeries, um, backfilling, uh, health human resource management putting all of those protocols in place are to try and get us through this next few weeks that are going to be the most challenging yet on our health care system. So I do want to talk a little bit about um, you know, the orders that we put in place. So we needed to do this in December, and I said that at the time that we put these orders in place. There are many things that we look at when we put orders in place. One of them are, are the factors related to the virus, the transmissibility, how much of it is circulating in the community. And when we were, uh, December 18th is when we had our first Omicron, by that uh, next week we were seeing it dramatically increase and we were seeing transmission rates explode in our communities. And that's when uh, we had to think down the line what does that mean in terms of potential for people ending up in hospital? And you've seen some of the modeling that has shown that the potential could have been quite dramatic um, even before now. That's one of the things. Then we also look at what are the settings where this virus can transmit more readily and who is in those settings and what are they doing. So that's where wearing a mask becomes more important. That's where if you're seated and uh, wearing a mask versus exercising vigorously or singing or yelling, whether you're in an indoor environment versus an outdoor environment, whether it's crowded or less crowded, whether you're quiet, your own personal risk and vaccination status. Those are all things that we take into effect. And the fact that we know that vaccine card made a difference in terms of who was in some of these settings um, because uh, we were able to understand vaccination status of people in the settings. Plus we look at things like prior outbreaks, what we had seen in, in patterns over the last two years and transmission change, where they were highest. And that um, led to us putting in the restrictions that we did around bars and nightclubs where it's um, an indoor environment and gyms as well and fitness centers, indoor environment with uh, um, vigorous exercise or where you're not wearing masks. So the, the risk profile in those settings is much higher where we've seen outbreaks in the past, many outbreaks and chains of transmission from those areas. We've also put in, as you know, um, restrictions on um, gatherings and events, some of which were, um, were stopped for the period of time, others where we put in increased um, 
uh, capacity limits for those where people are seated and masked and not moving around. And, of course, really important, recognizing that because there's a lot of this virus in the community and because we have a high level of vaccination, many people will have um, asymptomatic or very mild symptoms and they may not recognize it. So that's where things like COVID safety plans in businesses, like the plans we have in, in schools and daycares and childcare centers are really important because um, it means that you're wearing a mask in those settings. It means there are other measures in place to try and prevent transmission that look at all of these risk factors above. So that is um, the state of where we are right now in terms of um, this wave of the pandemic. I will also share that we, you know, we, we have been adjusting and to, uh, trying to understand in real time from multiple sources what's going on and what we need to do. We also need to adjust our measures and we are making changes to our testing guidance as we've talked about, um, but the starting point for all of us remains unchanged. If you're feeling unwell, stay home and stay away from others. And if you're struggling with your illness, seek medical care. If you're a close contact of somebody who you know has COVID, you need to self-monitor and limit your interactions. Wear a mask. If you have mild symptoms, you don't need to get tested, but you need to stay home until you're well enough to resume your regular activities. And of course, you're encouraged to inform your workplaces, schools, or childcare, but you don't need to contact public health. But you need to avoid high-risk settings if possible when you are ill, so it's not the time to go visit older members of your family. But you also need to follow COVID safety plans in your workplace, in your school, in your childcare. If you develop symptoms and are high risk or live or work in a high risk setting, then you do need to get tested. And that's what we are preserving our testing capacity for right now. And you need to follow public health guidance, including requirements for self-isolation based on vaccination status, so staying home for five days if needed. Given the rate of transmission at this time, testing should not be the indicator to be cautious and to take care. And the data that we've shown, there are some people that need to take care because there's a lot of virus in, this commun in our communities right now still. So if you are older, if you are somebody who's going through cancer treatments, if you're on immune suppressing drugs, you do need to take those extra precautions. And we need to take extra care with those people in our communities and our families um, who are uh, in that category as well. We will, of course, to continue to monitor and adjust um, as we learn more in the coming days and weeks. My message to everybody today is that we all need to remain vigilant and we must also use our, our common COVID sense now. This is different, but it is not something um, uh, that is, uh, but it is still something that we know how to handle and we know what to do. This is the respiratory season, which means we have COVID. We also have a little bit of influenza, quite a bit of RSV and other viruses circulating. So the protections you're taking for COVID-19 also help you and those around you with these other viruses. For parents with children in K-12 or childcare, if your children are ill, please keep them home. If they have mild illness, they can return to school when symptoms have resolved and they're feeling better and up to their usual activities. And the same applies for childcare. I know this is different from where we've been um, trying to make sure we're keeping COVID out of everything, but the reality is that we don't transmit as much if we're well. So these are the things that we need to, to consider now. And I recognize that clear, definitive, unchanging guidance is what we really want. But COVID is not allowing for that. The virus is changing and we need to adapt as well. It doesn't mean that what you did yesterday was wrong. And certainly we can, we have more and more evidence that all of those things that we did have made a tremendous difference in blunting the impact that this changing virus has had in our communities. And I think that's really important. And I especially am appreciative of everybody being um, cautious and taking those measures over the holiday season when I know it was challenging and it's hard and we really want it to be with others. 
But I'm asking everybody today to do their best and safest thing for my loved one and for yourself today. And that's um, where, what we're going to need to do to get us through this wave. But we are resilient and we are strong. And I'm confident we'll get through this wave as well and very soon get through this storm. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Minister Dix. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Henry. And uh, I wanted to, today to uh, follow up, first of all, by saying that the presentation, uh, PowerPoint presentation by Dr. Henry will be available on the BCCDC website and government websites, and we'll be sharing it uh, on uh, social media uh, channels as well, because it is useful, I know, for people. It's sometimes difficult when these are presented uh, and you're watching, say, on television, to see or to, to spend time with uh, the information that's provided. So that will be available uh, shortly. I want to provide an update on uh, rapid test inventory and use, as well as the uh, impact of sickness on healthcare workers and the healthcare system overall. First, I want to briefly touch, though, on the booster dose campaign. Um, over the last week, from January 6th to 13th, 319,752 booster doses have been administered in BC, an extraordinary achievement. Yesterday, a record number, 58,685. That's not all doses, that's just booster doses in that period. And I think um, it was 57,723 on Wednesday. In addition, 378,825 appointments have been made. I want to express my appreciation because with all of this going on, the, the booster dose campaign is ramped up to an extraordinary degree and the people who support that campaign both the volunteers and staff who make all of the arrangements at stations, our extraordinary team of community uh, pharmacists who do that work, and the healthcare workers who, of course, um, would frequently be doing other things, are doing many other things in healthcare that support it and that administer those doses. It is an exceptional success. And as the uh, presentation by Dr. Henry underlines, the decision to focus first on those who are most vulnerable is justified now by the evidence as we expected would be the case and as is the case in terms of providing protections. One of the most important groups, including uh, was clinically vulnerable people who have massively responded to an early invitation to get their booster doses, but in particular those over 70. Uh, Right now, approximately 77 or 80, 78 percent of all those over 70 have received their booster dose, and about 85 percent of those eligible. When you think about it, there are seven or eight percent of people over 70 who have not received uh, their initial, who are not vaccinated. So, 85 percent of those are eligible. But that said, there are still a significant number of people in risk groups who we are urging to get their booster to call today to go online today, to book your appointment today. There are appointments available in all health authorities in BC in the coming period, and we need you to book your appointment today. What the evidence showed, it's shown starkly by Dr. Henry, is the need for people in this category. There are currently 53,000 people in the 70 and over category who have received invitations to book. To be clear, the response has been overwhelming and has been positive, but 53,000 who have received invitations and have not yet booked. And I'm speaking to those people today and people such as me, people with type 1 diabetes who are, other, who are otherwise clinically vulnerable, to respond and to book your booster appointment today if you have not already done so. This is important for you, for your family, and for your health equally. All those, and it's shown again starkly in this period of Omicron, all those who are still unvaccinated haven't received their second dose or who are partially vaccinated or who are still unvaccinated. Now is the time to get vaccinated. You cannot see more starkly the result of that and the importance of that. I want to say that approximately 155,000 children 5 to 11 have been vac vaccinated with the special pediatric vaccine provided for them, and that number uh, continues to grow. Uh, but, but that it is an opportunity as well today for parents to register their children. About 190,000 have been registered to date. But I think it's critically important, particularly if you're in that category, particularly if you're over 70, particularly if you're clinically vulnerable, particularly if you have some immune suppressing condition that affects you, to be careful right now and to book your booster dose today. 
I cannot, I hope, be more clear than that. We've also been closely monitoring sickness levels across health services, especially in hospitals, in long-term care, and home support. And I wanted to brief you and bring you up to date on those numbers. We provided some numbers on Monday, and uh, I wanted to bring you up to date with more information. I can report that for the period uh, January uh, uh, 3rd to 9th, across all health authorities, uh, 21,517 total health care workers were off sick due to, due to illness of all kinds, including COVID-19. And as Dr. Henry says, there are a number of other respiratory illnesses. And of course, there are many other reasons why people would be off sick. From January 10th to 12th, 11,010 total health care workers were off sick due to COVID-19 or other illnesses uh, in this period. So a relative stability because uh, the weeks are somewhat different. January 3rd to 9th included a statutory holiday and two weekend days. So relatively the same level, but a very high level. I think what everyone uh, who's analyzing this would like to know is, well, what's the base for that? There are about 188,000 active health care workers in BC. So there's a lot of health care workers. And, uh, but this is still a lot of people who are affected in some way by sickness, whether it was one day or two days or more. And, um, and I just want to give you some comparisons. I can report um, that compared to the previous years. So if you compare to the previous years um, in, in, the, uh, 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 in 2021, which was, of course, during the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, when be prior to the first case coming of COVID-19 coming to British Columbia, here's what we have for all health authorities except Vancouver Island and interior health. So we wanted to get this data to you so you could have it for comparative purposes. So across those health authorities, so PHSA, Fraser Health, Providence, uh, Northern Health, Vancouver Coastal Health. In 2022, this year, 14,591 from January 3rd to 9th. In 2021, that number was 7,573. And in 2020, which was a higher influenza, influenza and respiratory illness year, if you'll recall, 8,802 um, uh, uh, healthcare workers called in sick in the equivalent week, the January, the equivalent week to January 3rd to 9th of those years. So roughly uh, double the number of sickness on a base of 188,000 healthcare workers. This is significant. I just want to say what it means for our system. It means that uh, two things I think that we need to take home. One, this is an immensely challenging time when you have incrementally um, 10,000 more healthcare workers off sick in a given week, either one day or, or more, um, that has an impact on services and we are adapting everywhere. And you've seen some of that adaptation in the last number of days. The cancellation of non-urgent uh, non scheduled surgeries for example, necessary both to free up staff to support people coming into hospital and necessary to ensure that acute care is well protected. But make no mistake about the challenges, not just in our major acute care centers, which are obviously focal points, obviously people coming in with COVID-19 as Dr. Henry has described, but also services that depend on a smaller group of workers, home support services, say, in the Caribou or in the Kootenays or in the Peace Country that are affected by um, COVID-19 with, with a smaller base of workers where the loss of one or two or three workers can have a profound effect. The message to everyone is twofold. One, yes, we need to be patient in these times. That the amount of health care being delivered is unprecedented at every level right now. Our healthcare workers are producing more output than ever before, but we need to be patient because these circumstances are affecting the system. This is the, this is the, the nature of this moment, this wave, this moment in the pandemic. But secondly, if you need care, get care. Don't stay home, don't wait. If you have a serious reason to get care, get care. Do not be deterred by this. Our healthcare teams are doing a remarkable job, not just dealing with COVID-19, not just dealing with the overdose public health emergency, which uh, occupies us enormously every day, not just dealing with uh, every other issue and every other issue dealt with the public, but in providing a high quality of service. There will be challenges, yes. Patience is required, yes. But if you need get care, get care. Regarding our rapid tests, as of end of day, January 13, 2022, BC has received 4,859,800 rapid tests total 
and deployed 3,430,400 of these tests to key strategic areas. That leaves a current inventory of 1,429,400 tests. 563,000 of the current inventory are not suitable for deployment, for takeaway or personal use. They require special equipment, administration by trained health care professionals, and cannot be broken down or repackaged for self-administration. These tests will continue to be used at the discretion of medical health officers in appropriate settings to manage clusters and outbreaks. That leaves 866,100 tests that are more suitable for self-administered self use. This week, we have already allocated and sent out approximately 165,000 to acute health care facilities for testing of symptomatic health care workers, 90,000 for repackaging and distribution to testing sites across BC to replenish their supply. 200,000 are being prepared to support testing of symptomatic staff in the K-12 education sector across the province. Over 100,000 will be deployed for use by businesses and organizations as part of the point of care screening program. The balance will be allocated over the week ahead, consistent with the plan that was outlined in detail on December 21st, 2021. In addition, we will allocate existing inventories that are suitable for self-administered use to the following. 100,000 uh, tests are being prepared for deployment to the K-12 sector for testing of symptomatic students. Another 100,000 are being deployed to the acute care health, acute health care facilities for health care workers. More will be repackaged and distributed to testing sites. 115,000 more tests are being sent to the First Nations Health Authority. 50,000 uh, will be allocated to assisted living and 200,000 for post-secondary education for symptomatic fa faculty and students. The balance and new inventory that arrives will be allocated over the days ahead, consistent with the plan outlined on December 21st, replenishing long-term care, education sectors, and acute care hospitals for staff and testing sites. For almost uh, two years, as you know, we've been doing these briefings, and uh, the first one was at the end of January 2020, and a lot has changed. But I want to say some things happened. COVID-19 is still the same. It still lives to spread, it spreads to live, and in that purpose it's relentless. It's not interested in our discussions or in our debates. It spreads to live, and we have seen how it can do so again and again in the pandemic. The opportunities we give to COVID-19, secondly, are essential to its survival, and we need to take the actions, follow the guidance and the orders that have been provided, and take the measures we're taking because when we allow cracks in our defenses, COVID-19 will exploit those gaps. Third, one of the great assets is, is, frankly, our public health teams who have been exceptional. The Provincial Health Office, led by Dr. Henry, the BC Centre for Disease Control, all of our teams have been exceptional. The guidance they provided, the work that they, they have done unfailingly, every day, seven days a week, is a huge asset to British Columbians and I, for one, am grateful to them and to Dr. Henry for those efforts. And that brings us, I think, to the fourth thing we know, that the greatest asset in our battle against COVID-19 has been and always will be us, each one of us. When we hear about the challenges in our hospital sector, there are things we can do both to protect ourselves and to support our healthcare workers, including adhering to orders, following guidance, using masks where appropriate. Every time we choose action over delay, attention over disregard, awareness over denial. And finally, I would say that in battling COVID and maintaining our humanity while we do, what matters is what we do in the moment. If you haven't been vaccinated up to now, get vaccinated and join the fight. If you haven't been following all the rules up to now, no judgment. Start to do that. Start to support one another. Protect those that you love and those that you don't know. We need to, more than ever before, rededicate our efforts in these next weeks, these difficult weeks for our healthcare system. And the information that we provided today illustrates that, that while cases may have peaked, hospitalizations have not. And we need to work together to support each other in these difficult times. And with that, I'm happy to take your, we're happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. A reminder to media on the line, please press star one to enter the queue. You'll be limited to one question and one follow up. Our first question comes from Justine Hum to Hunter, rather, Globe and Mail. Justine, are you there? Okay, we'll move on to Richard Zussman, Global News. 
Uh, Dr. Henry, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Dr. Mark Lefishin did a presentation yesterday to uh, Coastal Health. <coughs> excuse me. And part of it, he said, we do have a number of health orders that were put in place, and they were put in place largely because of uncertainty about what would happen about Omicron. And now that we are certain it's less severe, they will have to be stepped down. So first, is it responsible uh, for somebody in a position like Dr. Lefishin to be saying that health orders should be lifted soon considering we are not even at the peak of hospitalizations left and how should people read this should we anticipate that uh, next week you will be easing uh, those current restrictions that are in place yeah so i think from the very beginning and you know i talked to my public health team of which dr lecician is one um pretty much every day but uh, you know formally about three times a week so uh you know i think what he the presentation he was giving to other healthcare workers um reflects uh some of that discussion and we have always from the very beginning tried to put in as i've called it the least restrictive means trying to um do what we need to do based on what we know, and I talked a little bit about the factors that we look at um, going into those orders. And yes, absolutely. Um, in December, when we were looking at this curve going up, and there were so many unknowns that we needed to take action that would protect our healthcare system as much as possible and account for the worst case scenarios that could happen. And we try and do that in a measured way and finding that balance between not interfering with um, societal uh, um, uh, the things that we do in society that are so important for us, including the economy. I mean, people working is important. People going to school is important. So it has always been about trying to find those balance. And I, as you know, um, made uh, those, uh, those orders um, come up for review on the 18th. And I gave you some sense today of where we are, and we are in the process of looking at what is it that we need to do and what can we do uh, to change these things and, and um, look at the restrictions that are in place and are they needed anymore. And I'll have more to say about that on Tuesday. Richard, do you have a follow-up? You know, with some of the data you presented here around severity, we are seeing... Um, in some cases, you know, many people in this province are making different decisions. We are seeing some people make the decisions that they're going to get on with their lives and they may get COVID and hopefully not end up in hospital. Are you worried at all about a lax attitude towards Omicron and people making decisions uh, that could lead to problems? You know, and just if you could, and for, for Minister Dix, you know, we've seen this example where a hockey team uh, in Burnaby traveled uh, to Alberta to play in a tournament because there are no tournaments allowed here. Is that okay to do that even though it's not against the rules and basically an indication that they're not particularly worried about, you know, risk and, and there could be, you know, COVID cases now linked uh, to that travel? Yeah, so I, th I think, you know, I'm, I, I'm disappointed to hear that because we made it very clear that tournaments are a source. And, you know, look at the, the information that I presented. Those are places where people come together over a longer period of time, etc. Um, and so it's not surprising to me that there are cases related to that. Um, I think we, what I've been trying to say is that we need to look at risk and yeah, for, for many people, the experience that they have now, we've seen a lot of people with COVID. There's everybody that, at least everybody I know, knows somebody that uh, has had COVID now, which is different, which is different from even uh, in November um, when Delta was, uh, was circulating in our province. So it has changed our thinking and for many younger people who are highly connected, who are vaccinated, it's not been such a big deal. For many young people, including some of the young people in my life, it actually has been a big deal. It, they may not have ended up in hospital um, because you know they're vaccinated, but they've been feeling really lousy, and it, it's it's not a nice thing to be sick with this virus. So there is a balancing of those risks. What we're saying is, yeah, we need to get on with our lives. We need to move through this. We're in a challenging time right now. We're learning more about this. Um, there are some people who are still more likely to get severe disease. And if there are people in our families, in our communities, we need to support them and help them through this period of time. And particularly older people 
people who have underlying illnesses. So that part is the same. Even if you're vaccinated, if you're over 70, you need to take some issues, some precautions right now. It's not the time to go into large indoor group settings. Um, give yourself another few weeks for us to get through this wave. Um, if you're somebody who's going through cancer treatments, we know that you've always have to take precautions COVID or not, prior to this pandemic, people who were going through cancer treatments had to be very careful around, especially during respiratory season, because uh, a, a, a virus can cause severe illness regardless of, of your immune system and the amount of vaccine that you have. So we all need to think about those things in our situation right now. And we're trying to, to be able to adapt to what we're seeing going on right now in our community. So we do have a period of time that we're not yet there. Um, we're going to have a tough time in our healthcare system. And we talked about this because healthcare workers are, are getting sick enough that they, they cannot go into work for a period of time. So if you have an elderly relative who's getting home care, you might need to call them and support them right now. They might need some extra help from family and friends during this period of time because of, of resource constraints. So it is us moving to trying to get on with our lives, to interrupt society as least as, as we can. Um, but we're also you know, recalibrating and adjusting as we're learning, as we're going right now. And Minister? Thank you. I think I'd just say two things that um, Dr. Henry and Public Health brought in new measures on December 20th, on December 23rd, on December 29th, and December 31st. And I know because I'm, I watch this uh, obviously closely and we're in uh, multi-daily contact with everyone and teams working together between health systems and public health, what they go through when they make those decisions, understanding that they have impacts on other people uh, when you put in place restrictions. And so when those decisions, and I think the balance in British Columbia between restrictions and what people can do have been, has been really clear-sighted, a full understanding of both the impact of COVID-19 and the impact of potential restrictions. So if you ask, are restrictions being reviewed? They're reviewed every single day by public health, discussed every single day by public health, and have been for months and months and months, whether it's in the impact on long-term care, and that impact can be profound. I can tell you that personally, how profound it can be. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say is that, you know, we're, we announced some weeks ago in advance, right? not because we needed to on that day, but in advance, that we were um, delaying and postponing non-urgent uh, scheduled surgeries. An enormous decision, a huge sacrifice for the individuals involved. So when people talk about sacrifice and getting on with life, the biggest sacrifice is being made by the people who provide that care, but more importantly, the people receiving surgery and their families. That is a massive sacrifice. Surely more important than being able to go to Alberta to play in a hockey tournament. And I think that we have to put it in context how seriously we take it and how sometimes you have to bring in measures and orders in advance before they're effectively needed in order to make the changes that are required. I'd say with respect to that, I'm, I'm not, you know, there's a tendency, I think, to uh, point fingers at people. The people involved there who probably are dealing with COVID-19 now don't need to be told it or scolded or anything else. Not at all. I mean, when pe people, we all make mistakes all the time. And uh, I don't think we need to dwell on it. But what I, what I said is at the beginning, uh, Richard, is the most important thing. COVID doesn't listen to us, it doesn't argue to us, it doesn't listen to our excuses and say, okay, this is a way around the rules. It lives to transmit. And how we respond to it reflects who we are as well and what we care about together. And I think the people of BC, their response to the booster campaign, everywhere I go, their response and the way they treat people in public places, everywhere I go, the support they give to one another, the work done by teachers and workers in grocery, the work done by healthcare workers, this is inspiring. So there are no lectures to give. Start today. If you made a mistake yesterday, start today. If you haven't got vaccinated up to now, get vaccinated today. Book your appointment. So let's not talk about what people could have done yesterday. Let's talk about what we can all do today and not, not to offer lectures or lessons to too many people all the time to focus on what we can do today to help one another during these really challenging two to three weeks ahead of us. Hi, 
Hi, Dr. Uh, I was wondering if you can tell me how accurate will the modeling data be now that with the Omicron variant, I think one, and uh, at the end, how accurate is the Omicron modeling, or is the modeling given Omicron? Is that, is that given because uh, because of how Omicron is uh, affecting everyone? I mean, uh, how uh, the how accurate is the data uh, given through modeling? Because uh, until now we've had pretty good estimates of where we are, but. With Omicron affecting everyone, how accurate is this data now uh, given through modeling? Uh, and what is next after this? Yeah, so um, it, models, I've said this many, many times, models are always dependent on um, the, the inputs, what you put into them, the parameters that you use. And that's why all models are different and all models are wrong. But some of them are very useful. And so, yes, uh, we've been working with our modeling team. There's several modeling teams across the country. Um, and that's why we try and do things, in, look at, at the same picture with using several different methodologies. And what you'll see is we didn't present the, uh, the reproductive number because that is not something um, that is uh, robust with the data that we have right now. But what we focused on is, is hospitalization and the new admissions to hospital. And that is robust data. It's robust data given uh, what we know about our hospital system, about who's being admitted, and also about things like um, we can have a pretty Pretty good estimate of transmission rates in the community, um, an estimate. Uh, we also have a pretty good estimate of things around booster doses and who's got them and stuff like that. So there are many, many different caveats and, and what we call sensitivity analyses that are done with these models. And our team at uh, BCCDC, who, uh, and uh, Mike Irvine and, and Jat Sandu and Michael Otterstetter and our team at uh, BCCDC have been immersed in this for two years now, and Kate Molina and the team. Anyway, there's a whole group of them um, who look at all of these different parameters. So accurate, they're never a prediction. What they are is a set of scenarios that we can um, get a good sense of what might happen. So I am confident in them. Um, you can see if you look at the model that we've presented um, with Omicron, taking into account all of the things that we've learned about incubation period and length of stay and all that stuff. And you can see there's a whole wide shaded area. And that's important. That tells us the, the, the sort of um, universe of what uh, could be the true um, response, uh, the true path or the true, true pattern. So these are all things that help us. It all has to be put in a context as well of, of values and preferences and choices that we make in judgments. So it, it is really important, and we've been working with these models since I presented the first one in March of, uh, of 2020. So none of them are a prediction or um, you know, accurate in that sense, um, but they do help us understand the trajectory. And I am confident in these models that we're presenting, um, helping us understand what's going to happen in the next few weeks. In terms of what's next, um, in, ter and in terms of this pandemic, um, you know, I think we've seen such a dramatic change with the change in the virus in Omicron and such dramatic spread that we now have a level of, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> combination immunity from both Omicron but also vaccination, that I do think this is a step closer to us living and the, the virus becoming endemic in our, um, in our community over time. What we don't yet know is how those patterns are going to look in the coming years and how much change we're going to see in the virus in coming years. So how long our booster dose is going to be protective, whether we're going to see it uh, follow um, other respiratory viruses and be worse in the winter and the summer, or whether we're going to see it bimal. So there's many things we don't yet know, and I think the WHO made that comment, and it's not influenza yet, because we know a lot about the patterns that influenza undergoes. Um, but we're getting there, and I think this is a, a big step towards that. Hina, do you have a follow-up? I do. Uh, I was also wondering, Dr. Henry, how many homeless people are affected by the new wave? Uh, and uh, do we have any numbers on them? Or 
quickly. And how we're tracking them, and isn't it especially important that we track them because they tend to move. So uh, they are both at a higher risk of acquired. I'm sorry. Can you can you maybe try and speak closer to the mic? You keep breaking up, and it's difficult to hear. I think what you asked was about people who are homeless, or yeah, uh, I'm having problem with my phone. Uh, uh, I was wondering if you can tell me how many homeless people are affected by this new wave, and do we have any numbers, or why aren't we tracking them? Uh, especially since they, uh, the segment of population tends to move around a lot more, so they have a higher chance of both uh, getting the virus as well as spreading it. Yeah, so a couple of things. We, we don't actually, uh, we, we do support people who are homeless in a whole variety of ways. And one of the things that we focused on from the very beginning is making sure that uh, we have uh, resources in place for people who are homeless for testing. Um, that's something we started very early on in, in a number of communities, and also um, prioritizing people in, um, uh, who are homeless or underhoused or living in shelters for vaccination. So that is something that we've uh, done uh, in many communities around the province. And we've been working with uh, the uh, communities, the downtown east side. We saw quite a, an increase in numbers of cases during Delta in the fall, in that community in particular. And we're monitoring, uh, we're not seeing huge uh, outbreaks in that community right now. And, and the kudos go to the teams who are working in the shelters and the supports in uh, places in the downtown east side and our public health teams and the community nurses and the outreach nurses who are uh, the outreach teams who are supporting people in those communities. So um, we, we are not seeing a, a tremendous impact in people who are homeless pop in different communities around the province, more so than um, any other community. And we are obviously trying to make it as easy as possible uh, for people to get booster doses and second doses and first doses in that community again too. Next question, Gordon Hoekstra, Vancouver Sun. Oh, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask a question around um, the restrictions and the possibility of them being lifted or are, are, are being reviewed on Tuesday. I mean, given that the next two or three weeks are going to be challenging, um, what what exactly what do you have to see in order to you know lift or reduce the restrictions on Tuesday? Yeah, so those are ongoing discussions that we're having around the different aspects. So there's, as you know, different things in place in different parts of our community. I think that you will see that the, the COVID safety plan um, structure is going to stay in place for some time. Um, so those are ongoing discussions, and I'll have more to say about this next week. Do you have a follow-up, Gordon? Yeah, I'm just I'm just trying to get a sense a little bit on the on the on the hospitalizations and the healthcare workers. Are, are we at a point uh, where the the you know the, the number of staff sick are impacting the ability to uh, care for people with COVID or other people in the hospital at this point? Minister, from it's probably best for you to answer that. I think it affects in a number of ways. Obviously, the number of people. Who walk in with other conditions for with COVID-19, and Dr. Henry has spoken about this affects things such as the cohorting we like to do in hospitals and have been doing, uh, essentially separating uh, uh, population testing positive for COVID-19 when there's more people in the hospital. And look, let's be clear: you you start with um, you you have uh, about 10,000 more healthcare workers off sick than the same period last year. That has an impact. And it has an impact in hospitals, and we've made adjustments for that. That's why we decided uh, bef well before Christmas, the week before Christmas, to take the steps on non-urgent scheduled surgeries. That involves, obviously, thousands and thousands of people every day of healthcare workers so that we're able to redeploy and also uh, redeploy and support immunization, which we've been doing as well. So, yes, it affects it. And in particular, Gordon, I think, it affects it with respect to services are provided, not so much in the hospital, although it has profound impacts there, but also in the community and every long-term care home that's facing an outbreak. Because when an outbreak protocol, there's lots of talk about visitation, but when outbreak protocols are announced in long-term care homes, they have really profound impact on, on other activities, including social activities within the care home that are important to the lives of residents. And equally, in other services in the community that are critically important, uh, we have smaller numbers of staff people providing those services. So, yes, 
the level of COVID-19 has an impact. Yes, we have taken very strong action to deal with that. And yes, those actions are reviewed every single day because they can affect a facility in a small town in that day. And if it's interior health or northern health in that case, or uh, hospitals as large as Anchor General and Surrey Memorial Hospital, the same. So the short answer is yes, it affects the healthcare system. But I want to encourage people, if they need a, to go to a hospital, if they need care, to get that care, that our healthcare workers continue, 188,000 of them, to provide uh, outstanding care. And, to, and there will be a need, some need for patients. Our, our teams are working and we're putting plans in place if the situation worsens or is worse in some places to make adjustments both regionally and in every uh, and across uh, every part of public health care. So yes, it affects it. Yes, you can't have more people off sick and it not affect uh, the amount of care you can do. And that's why we're taking action under our surge plans every single day to do that. Our administrators who have formidable work under these circumstances are frequently now, both at BCAHS and everywhere else, working at the front line as we supplement and try and support uh, our staff teams. I want to thank everybody from at every level of healthcare, healthcare workers, members of the HEU, the HSA, the BCNU, our administrators, members of the doctors of BC, uh, members of the BCGU, and many other unions, the UFCW, many other unions who are involved in healthcare and the workers who work, who are members of those unions who are making such a huge difference today. And we're just gonna to continue to work every day and we're gonna to have to make adjustments sometimes several times a day to make sure that we support uh, the most urgent care. Next question, Rob Buffum, CTV. Oh, hi, thank you for taking my question. My first question is on behalf of a colleague and it relates to long haul COVID. Um, they're wondering, you know, in light of the fact that the province has been discouraging many people from getting a, a PCR test, uh, unless you're in, you know, a vulnerable group, what what do you say to folks who are getting long haul COVID or maybe in the future who need to and are unable to work and need to bring in a, a WCB application and don't have proof that they were, you know, diagnosed with COVID because they didn't get a test? You know, this is a, it's a reality that we're facing right now that there just is not um, a PCR testing available uh, for mild people. I will uh, for mild cases, and I will say that we are still trying to understand whether Omicron leads to that uh, type of, of long-term complication as much as other uh, variants like Delta in particular. Um, I've also been talking with our clinical care team, um, with the, the uh, long haul clinics that we have, and there are other ways of being able to determine if somebody was actually infected with, uh, with COVID-19 once they have uh, symptoms down the line. So not readily available tests, but you can do serology and a few other things. So we're working out how to manage that, and uh, the same goes for uh, um, for working with WorkSafe around worker compensation issues. But, you know, the bottom line right now is we, we just don't have that testing capacity. And for many people, a rapid test is what they need, uh, what, which, is, uh, which will be more available. Um, so those are all challenging things that we'll have to work through. And we're, we're not alone in that. This is happening everywhere. So being able to, to determine if people have ongoing symptoms related to a COVID infection is something that we can do um, post hoc, as it were. Rob, do you have a follow-up? I do, and it's sort of a double-barreled question. I'm wondering, in light of what we've heard today about cases peaking or already having peaked, hospitalizations likely to peak in the next couple of weeks, um, natural immunity from Omicron spreading, as well as we'll know there'll be more vaccines and boosters in people's arms uh, by February. Can you give us a sense? You've talked about this being a big step towards it becoming an endemic. What might the end of February, March look like? Could this be the sort of the, the rosiest time in this pandemic yet? And I also, I'm, I'm hoping you might be able to give us a, a clue as to what we'll hear on Tuesday. Are there going to be any restrictions that may get lifted or modified in relation to gyms or otherwise? Um, I'm going to defer the, the Tuesday question to Tuesday. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, I do think, I, I think this spring, we're going to be in a different position across Canada, across North America, across much of, of Europe. The caveat that we have is that, um, you know, we, this virus continues to change and, and modify itself. 
and and surprise us in many ways persist as well so until we globally have that level of protection we are still at risk of something else arising um, so there are still those um, those concerning caveats, and as I mentioned, we, we don't yet know what the patterns are going to be of this virus circulating in our communities. Is it going to be like other coronaviruses that eventually become another cause of the common cold for most people? Um, are we still going to have more severe illness being caused um, in certain populations, and which populations are there? We have a pretty good idea, probably, of who they might be. Um, but those are some things that we're going to work out over time. But I do think this is a real transition in our um, moving out of the pandemic and learning to live with this virus. Um, I think you know, I've said this for the last three years, but if uh, we make it to Easter, I think we're going to be in a really um, different place. And yeah, I do think we're going to be able to put aside some of the things that we've been uh, having to do on a regular basis. And it goes back to how I've tried to talk about these things. You know, the many layers become more important when there's more virus, the more transmissible, more risk in the community. So, like last summer when we had very little virus, um, things like mask wearing in every situation were less important if we kept a respectful distance from people and, you know, did all of those other things that try and um, to try and make sure we weren't putting thing, people at risk. So it's going to be a, a, a transition. It's not going to be an abrupt change. I think a transition as hopefully this virus will uh, settle down in our communities over the next little while. Next question, Justine Hunter, Globe and Mail. Justine, are you on mute? Okay, failing that, we have time for one more question. We're gonna to move to John Hernandez, CBC. John, please go ahead. Hello, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, uh, Dr. Henry, you mentioned children with mild illness can return to school when their symptoms have resolved. Um, why do you think there's still some confusion around that? There is also seems to be a bit of confusion around whether children with no symptom, symptoms but with COVID in their household can go to school. Yeah, there's confusion because we it's a change. And it's a change to adapt to the situation that we're in now. And it really is, you know, m making these um, recommendations in real time, given what we know. And we know there's a lot of viruses circulating right now. So the most, and we know that the access to testing is, is limited. Um, so the, the best advice that we have right now is that if your child is, is ill, keep them home from school, from childcare, and when they're better and able to uh, fully participate in activities, they can go back to school or childcare. That's an, that's an important sort of adaptation to where we are right now with Omicron in, in our communities. And the same goes for if uh, Omicron's in the household. It's often very difficult to tell if it came in an asymptomatic child or if the child was exposed. We need to do our best um, for somebody who's tested positive. Um, if you uh, test positive, then the five-day uh, period of isolation. Um, but if you have mild illness and, and not tested, it goes for all of us right now that we can go back to activities uh, when, we're, when the symptoms are resolving and we're fully able to participate in our normal day-to-day -day activities. John, do you have a follow-up? Yes, I do, and I'll also just ask for these answers in French at the end. Uh, Dr. Henry, what are you hearing about uh, when booster doses will be approved for kids 12 to 17 in Canada? Uh, many teens are, or many teens are quickly approaching that six-month anniversary of their second dose. Yeah, so whether a booster dose is actually needed in 12 to 17 year olds is something that's still under active discussion. I know the US FDA approved it and they have an, a, a different process than we do and they approved it for, uh, for children, so the, the question is out there. Um, many other countries have been looking at the data and, and uh, not made a decision about whether booster doses are actually needed for most children. I will tell you that the National Advisory Committee on Immunization is actively looking at the data on that question. Um, we had some discussions this week and there's more next week. Uh, so we'll have more to say about that uh, probably end of next week or early the week after. 
effectivement, on va avoir euh, plus à dire sur ce, à ce sujet dans les, euh, à, à la fin de la semaine prochaine. Mais euh, je dirais juste en général, je pense que euh, euh, on a pris une décision aux États-Unis, les USCDC, bien sûr. Euh, C'est une question qui a été sous euh, considération de la part de, au niveau national à Health Canada et par le National Advisory Council on Immunization. Et on, on va bien entendu attendre leur, leur conseil avec, euh, avec naturellement, avec euh, beaucoup de volonté. Euh, donc nous sommes prêts à poursuivre cette, ce voie, mais ça doit suivre l'évidence. Et on va continuer à soutenir cette idée de l'évidence. La santé publique est tellement importante pour tout le monde. De toute façon, on a un grand nombre de personnes. La semaine dernière, plus de 300 000 qui ont reçu leur troisième dose. Il faut continuer de le faire. Il y a 54 personnes, 54 000 personnes qui ont plus de 70 ans, qui ont reçu une invitation, qui, qui ne sont pas, qui n'ont pas un rendez-vous avec nous pour leur troisième dose. Et j'encourage tout le monde. Uh, si on a besoin d'une première dose, un deuxième, une deuxième dose ou une troisième dose, de, de, de nous téléphoner ou d'aller à notre site web aujourd'hui. Uh, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you on Tuesday.